Hello, and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager. And in this week's Weekend Essay Podcast, we have feature writer Amanda Newman Smith explaining why holding on to staff is not just about money. Take it away, Amanda. Why do you work for your employer? Be honest. Is it the money? Is it other perks? Is it the people you work with or the clients you deal with? Perhaps you're lucky and it's a bit of everything that keeps you content enough not to look elsewhere. Or perhaps you are eyeing a move and are only with your present employer until the right opportunity comes along. I ask these questions because I've recently been looking at how vice firms can retain staff without giving them a pay rise. I've just realised that sounds like a Tightwood's Guide to Recruitment by Ebenezer Scrooge, but I don't mean it like that. It's more of a recognition that companies have had to tighten their belts, like everyone else, as the cost of doing business has risen. Although there is some optimism, depending on what you read and believe, being careful in spending the money you have is sensible for businesses as well as individuals. Money is the reason most people go out to work, so a job obviously needs to pay people enough to make it worth their while especially when you factor in costs that are unavoidable if you have to go into an office like season tickets for travel or childcare, as not all firms will offer perks in these areas. Although I hear from recruitment firms that most employees will get pay rises this year, realistically I expect them to fall short of inflation in most cases. That's life, but not everyone is prepared to shrug it off and stick around waiting for economic conditions to improve, especially if they are struggling to manage on the salary they are getting now. But I was astounded to read earlier this week that research from jobs website read.co.uk suggests 71% of UK workers are either looking for a new job or are open to new opportunities. That is a staggering number and it surprised me as I'd have expected job security to take priority in the current environment. But my contacts in the recruitment world tell me that there are still more job vacancies than people to fill them and most job hunters are already employed, so it is a market that favours the candidates. Money talks is a phrase I've heard a lot to explain people's eagerness to move. A bit more money is always nice to have, but there's a difference between that and people having to look for another job out of necessity because they can't pay their bills on existing salaries. In that situation, I don't think anything the employer can do bar a pay rise will cut it. But even a pay rise is unlikely to bolster salaries as much as negotiating a salary with a new employer. My husband, Dan, sees a lot of game playing around salary negotiation in his line of work. Many a time he has interviewed someone from another construction firm for a job and offered them an uplift on their current salary as an incentive to join. But then the candidate goes back to their employer, tells them what is on offer if they move and miraculously... That firm matches it, so the candidate stays put. It's highly frustrating for an employer to realise they were being used by a job candidate as a bartering tool, but it comes with the territory for Dan. As he says, he is looking for people who can negotiate costs with clients as part of their role as quantity surveyors. So if they can't negotiate their own salary, it doesn't look good to an employer. But for the rest of us outside this industry, it shows why it's important for firms to work out how to retain good staff in the first place. You might have open and honest communication with your employees about their remuneration packages, but when you're recruiting, that might not be the case with the candidate and their existing employer. Dan tells me that sometimes in his industry, threatening to leave or following it through before returning to the firm in a more senior role is the only way some people can progress. I find that sad, but I've known other people in other industries who have had to leave because their face just doesn't fit the roles they want to step up to long term and they're constantly overlooked. It's like they have to gain experience elsewhere to become visible because they will never get a chance with their existing employer. In that situation, a pay rise would only delay the inevitable departure. A pay increase may act as something of a sticking plaster, helping to retain employees in the short term, Laura Tracy, employment partner at national law firm Threefs, told me. Longer term, though, firms that offer a better employee experience are the ones that will hold on to employees. I've also seen Dan experience that in his career. He's had promotion and the salary increase that comes with that, but still not been happy. 
I didn't understand why. What more can the company do, I asked. Then he explained. To Dan, it wasn't a true promotion that recognised him as the best person for the job. A new fancy job title that was meaningless because the role was essentially the same and a few more quid each month that lost its wow factor once tax was taken off didn't have the impact the employer was hoping for. It felt like a sob and when the right position came along elsewhere, Dan left. If I was an employer, I'd want to do all I could to ensure good employees were content enough not to leave. Like moving house, recruiting new staff is something I wouldn't want to do too often because of the hassle and the costs involved. As executive recruitment firm Bentley Lewis founder Lewis Maller told me, giving staff a pay rise is usually cheaper than losing them, redistributing their work, which could impact on productivity elsewhere in the team, then having to advertise for a placement and pay them more than their predecessor's pay rise would have been. Having watched various versions of the TV show Undercover Boss, I'm aware that the people at the top may not know what's really going on in the company below a certain level. It's not necessarily because they're not interested or they haven't got the time. It can simply be that the people around them see their role as protecting the big boss from the minutiae of company life. But it's so important for them to see these things and not beneath those in senior positions. I think that can be a problem as it's often a shock for bosses to see how many great people they employ who are not getting the recognition, the support, the promotion or the salary they deserve. Even in companies that like to think they have their fingers on the pulse when it comes to talent spotting from within and caring about their employees, talented people are stuck in dead end roles or struggling to make ends meet while going above and beyond for customers. And it's a travesty that it goes unnoticed until the boss goes incognito with a TV crew in tow. With the cost of living crisis biting hard for many UK workers, you can understand why many are looking for pastures new. But like Laura Tracy, I don't think money is the main consideration in the long term. At my first job in journalism on a small independent local newspaper, staff turnover was well below the usual rate for a local newspaper. The entire team comprised four people when I joined, an ex-Fleet Street journalist and three local lads he'd nurtured from scratch. One as a news editor, one a reporter and one in sales. None of them had been trained in journalism at university like I had. They had learned everything on the job and were all exceptional. I learned so much from each of them, but what sticks in my mind is the court reporting. All the other local newspapers I was familiar with had outsourced their court reporting to specialist agencies, but wanting to keep costs low, we did it ourselves. I started off just reporting everything I heard in court for the news editor to knock into shape when I got back. By the time I left, I knew exactly how far I could go with these reports within the law while keeping the entertainment factor intact. The hours were usually long and money was tight, so it was a struggle for these guys to run a car on the salary they were given. They walked or cycled into the office. It was a young team, but being several years younger than the rest of them, I was still living with my parents in a different borough and travelled in by bus. I hated having to get two buses to get to the office, but it was located on an industrial estate miles away from the nearest tube station, so I had no choice. The point is that these guys had been there long before I came on the scene and they stayed for a considerable time after I'd gone. It certainly wasn't money or employee benefits keeping them there, as there wasn't much in the way of those things. This was before auto-enrolment, wellbeing initiatives and such like. What I think kept them there was working for someone they liked and respected, who invested a lot of time, effort and himself in developing them, the team around them and the culture. It was a fun place to work, with a lot of good-natured teasing about the football teams we supported and the bands we liked. One colleague jokingly pinged his cup with a spoon loudly every time he wanted the sales guy to make a round of teas. The sales guy would give him some banter back. I'd rib the others, including the boss, about their washing up skills, as it was often difficult to tell the difference between the used cups and the clean ones. But as much as I loved the place, I didn't stay as long as I initially thought I would. It wasn't to do with a salary or the awkward commute or being the only female in the team. I wanted to specialise in features and a small publication like that, where everybody chipped in, just couldn't make a role like that work. Although I did get to write features, doing a lot of other things was unavoidable, even cold calling on the sales side. 
everyone mucked in with everything and that was just the way it worked. I found that a lot in my quest to become a feature writer. You could write features as long as you were prepared to do news and other things as well. Being a specialist is coveted in financial advice, but I think in publishing it can be seen as a bit of a luxury. Luckily for me, money marketing has never taken that view. That, along with the flexibility to work from home so I can avoid massive childcare costs, a salary that suits me, and a track record in employing lovely people has kept me here for almost 23 years. It's not just about money. Thanks, Amanda, for another great weekend essay podcast. We hope that you enjoyed it. Please do keep up to date with all our new releases via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you get your podcasts from. You can also keep up to date with all our new content published on the Money Marketing website, as well as our print edition, Money Marketing Magazine. So make sure to subscribe. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. See you next time.